India on the Eve of Crown Government by Baba Sahib Ambedkar, Part 7 It would be profitable to read what Lord Ellenborough has to say regarding these inland transit duties. While the cotton manufacturers of England are imported into India on payment of a duty of 2.5%, the cotton manufacturers of India are subjected to a duty on yarn of 7.5% to an additional duty upon the manufactured article of 2.5%. And finally, to another duty of 2.5% if the cloth should be dyed after the Rowana Pass has been taken out from it as white cloth. Thus, altogether, the cotton goods of India consumed in India pay 17.5%. The raw hide pays 5%. On being manufactured into leather, it pays 5% more. And when the leather is made into boots and shoes, a further 5% is added. Thus, in all, there is a duty of 15% on leather goods in India. In what manner do we continue to treat our own sugar? On being imported into a town, it pays 5% in customs, 5% in town duty, and when manufactured, it pays on exportation from the same town 5% more, in all for 15%. No less than 235 separate articles are subjected to inland duties. The tariff includes almost everything of personal or domestic use and its operation combined with the system of search is of the most vexatious and offensive character, without materially benefiting the revenue. The power of search, if really exercised by every custom house officer, would put a stop to internal trade by the delay it would necessarily occasion. It is not exercised except for the purpose of extortion. Added to this was the lack of uniform currency in India. All these were a myth means to kill Indian industry. Frederick List says, had they sanctioned the free importation into England of Indian cotton and silk goods, the English cotton and silk manufacturers must of necessity soon come to a stand. India had not only the advantage of cheaper labour and raw material, but also the experience, the skill and the practice of centuries. The opinion of Mr. H. H. Wilson, the historian of India, is still more emphatic. It is of also a melancholy insistence, he admits, of the wrong done to India by the country on which she has become dependent. It was stated in evidence in 1813 that the cotton and silk goods of India set up to the period could be sold for a profit in the British market at a price from 50 to 60 percent lower than those fabricated in England. It consequently became necessary to protect the latter by duties of 70 and 80 percent on their value or by positive prohibition. Had this not been the case, had not such prohibitory duties and decrees existed, the mills of Paisley Erid Manchester would have been stopped in their outset and could scarcely have been again set in motion even by the power of steam. They were created by the sacrifice of the Indian manufacturer. Had India been independent, she would have retaliated, would have imposed prohibited duties upon a British goods and would thus preserve her own productive industry from annihilation. This act of self-defence was not permitted to her. She was at the mercy of the stranger, and British goods were forced upon her without paying duty, and the man foreign manufacturer employed the arm of political injustice to keep down and ultimately strangle the competitor with whom he could not contend on equal terms. With the result, to quote the words of Mr. Chaplin, that many manufacturers have been compelled to resort to agriculture for maintenance, a department already overstocked. Thus, the land revenue policy destroyed agriculture and the prohibitory protectionist policy of England ruined the industries of this country whose wealth attracted the swarms of flies that drenched her to the last dregs. The resulting misery and poverty of the people knew no bounds and is pathetically described by many a traveller and governor. Bishop Heber, travelling in India about 1830, wrote, Neither native nor European agriculturist, I think, can thrive with the present rate of taxation. Half the gross produce of the soil is demanded by the government, and this, which is nearly the average rate wherever there is not a permanent settlement, is sadly too much to leave an adequate provision for the present, even with the usual frugal habits of the Indians and the very inartificial and cheap manner in which they cultivate the land. Still more of it is an effective power to anything like improvement. It keeps the people even in favourable years in a state of abject penury, and when the crop fails in, fav in even a slight degree, it involves a necessity on the part of the government of enormous outlays in the way of remission and distribution, which, after all, do not prevent men, women and children 
in dying in the streets and roads, and the roads being strewed with carcasses. In Bengal, where, independent of its exuberant fertility, there is a permanent assessment, famine is unknown. In Hindustan, that is, the northern part of India, on the other hand, I found a general feeling among the king's officers, and I myself was led from some circumstances to agree with them, that the peasantry in the company's provinces are, on the whole, worse off, poorer, and more dispirited than the subjects of the native princes. And here, in Madras, where the soil is, generally speaking, poor, the difference is said to be still more marked. The fact is, no native land and no native prince demands the rent, which we do. And making every allowance for the superior regularity of our system, etc., I met with few men who will not in confidence own their belief that the people are overtaxed and that the country is in a gradual state of impoverishment. The collectors do not like to make this avowal official. Indeed, now and then a very able collector succeeds in lowering the rate to the people, while by diligence he increases it to the state. But, in general, all gloomy pictures are avoided by them reflecting on themselves and drawing on them censure from the secretaries at Madras or Calcutta, while these, in, all, in their turn, plead the earnestness with which their directors at home press for more money. Speaking of trade and industry, he says the trade of Surat is now of very trifling consequence, consisting of little but raw cotton, which is shipped in ports from Bombay. All the manufactured goods of the country are undersold by the British. A dismal decay has consequently taken place in the circumstances of the native merchants. Regarding the decay of Dhaka, the same authority says its trade is reduced to the 60th part of what it was. In all its splendid buildings, the factories and the churches of the French, Dutch and Portuguese nations are all into ruin and overgrown with jungle. To ameliorate their misery, natives petitioned Parliament, saying that every encouragement is held out to the exportation of England to India on the growth and foreign produce, as well as English industry, while many thousands of the natives of India, who a short time ago derived livelihood from the growth of cotton and the manufacture of cotton goods, are without bread in consequence of the facilities afforded to the produce of America and the manufacturing industry of England. But the appeal was made in vain in the interest of England and may always remain at the forefront in the eyes of those that were called upon to rule the destinies of India. Though, as Bishop Heber rightly says, that the officers of the company avoid all gloomy pictures of the misery of the people, there are others who, marked by the independence of opinions, are quite as explicit as are emphatic on this point. The Court of Directors wrote on May 7, 1766, We have the sense of the deplorable state from the corruption and rapacity of our servant, and the universal depravity of manners throughout the settlement. Think the vast fortunes acquired by a scene of the most tyrannic and oppressive conduct that ever was known in any age or country. Clive, though criminal himself, was conscious of the oppressions. For he wrote to George Dudley on September 8, 1766, but retrospection into actions which have been buried in oblivion for so many years, which, if inquired into, may produce discoveries which cannot bear the light, but may bring disgrace upon the nation, and at the same time blast the reputation of great, a good family. Sir Thomas Munro was so indignant at the misrule of the company that he said it would be more desirable that we should be expelled from the country altogether than the result of our system of government should be such an abasement of a whole people. Mr. Martin in his Eastern India, 1838, says the annual drain of 3 million on British India has amounted in 30 years at 12%, the usual Indian rate, compound interest to the enormous sum of 723,900,000 sterling. So constant in accumulating a drain, even in England, would soon impoverish her. How severe then must be its effects on India where the wage of labourers from two pence to three pence a day were the hundred millions of British subjects in India converted into a consumpting population, what a market would be presented for British capital, skill and industry. Mr. Frederick John Shore of the Bangalore Civil Service very pathetically said with the halcyon days of England of India are over. She has been drained of a large proportion of her wealth that she once possessed, and her energies have been cramped by a sordid system of misrule to which the interests of millions have been sacrificed for the benefit of the few. 
the gradual impoverishment of the people and the country under the mode of rule established by the english government has the grinding extortion to english government has affected the impoverishment of the country and people to an extent almost unparalleled the fundamental principle of the english has been to make the whole indian nation subservient in every possible way to the interest and benefit of themselves had the welfare of the people been our object a very different course would have been adopted and a very different result would have been followed but such was not the, to be the case nay it would have been unnatural had it been otherwise for mill says the government of a people by itself has a meaning and a reality for such a thing as government of one people by other does not exist and cannot exist one people may keep another from its for its own use a place to make money in a human cattle farm to be worked for the profit of its own inhabitants the administration of the east india company was a prototype of the roman provincial administration under the roman empire however local liberties were conserved monison says the roman provincial constitution in substance only concentrated military power in the hands of the roman governor while administration and jurisdiction were or at any rate were intended to be retained by the communities so that as much of the old political independence as well was at the capable of life might be preserved in the form of communal freedom the but, but the british suppressed everything and just as mr ferrero insists on our abandoning one of the most widespread misconceptions which teaches that rome administered her provinces in broad minded spirit consulting the general interest and adopting wide and benefit principles of government for the good of subjects so must we guard against any complacent view of the administration of the east india company so current among historians who labor hard to show that with the interval of 1700 years human nature had gradually advanced in moral standards short may have been our discussion of the few situation before the east india company it is quite sufficient to show that the supplanters of the moguls and the marathas were persons with no better moral fiber than the economic condition of india under the so coordinated despots and brigands was better than what was under the rule of those who boasted as being of a superior culture it is with industries ruined agriculture overstocked and overtaxed with productivity too low to bear high taxes with very few revenues and display of native capacities the people of india passed from the rule of the company to the rule of the crown the end